let's get back to Stanley Kubrick. He came to visit us when he was contemplating 2001 and collaborating with Arthur Clarke on the story and sort of dominating the, the production, every little detail. Uh, Stanley was a insane, he's also a chess fanatic. He wanted me to play chess with him, but I knew I would lose. And besides, uh, when I was a young mathematician, I was playing a chess game and suddenly realized this is harder than proving the theorem. <laughs> and what mathematicians like to do is prove theorems that nobody's ever proved before. And when you've proved one, it's good for a hundred years or a thousand. Whereas when you win or lose a chess game, so what? <laughs> I decided never to play with it again. <laughs> Stanley was annoyed because one of his ways of ingratiating himself is first to beat you at chess. <laughs> he also had a camera. He doesn't just make movies. And whenever he sees something, he goes snap, snap, snap. And I asked him what happened to the pictures. And he said, there are boxes of them in the attic in the basement. And uh, there must be a million such pictures. And I wonder what happened to them. Anyway, uh, back to the story. Uh, one of the things he wanted to do on his trip was to guess whether there would, what artificial intelligence would be like in 2001. He didn't want to know how it would work. He wanted to know if it could talk good. And uh, I said, yes, I think by 2001, computer speech will be pretty fluid. It's not very good yet, but it's getting there. 2001 is gone. And I said, but it probably won't understand anything you say to it. And he said, well, that's my department. I'm, or, and Arthur Clarks, so we're not worried about that. It's just a story. But I want the set to look right. And in particular, he was interested in computer graphics. He went everywhere. He looked at MIT, which was pioneering in computer graphics. Livermore, uh, the University of Utah was the big star in that field. He went to all those places. And later, when I visited him in, at the set in England, I asked him, uh, what did he think of computer graphics? And he, he said, none of it was good enough. And all of the animation, all the pictures in uh, 2001 are done by cartoonists. On, uh, in fact, you know, on the space station, when you see it from the outside, you see people doing various things in the windows. Those were, he got little eight millimeter projectors with film loops. So if you watch carefully, you might see people doing the same thing again. <laughs> so they, there was no trick photography of getting those pictures into the windows. They were actually being projected on them window glass. Another strange part of the story is that uh, the slab, the monolith, had been a tetrahedron because, you know, 2001 was made by combining several of Arthur Clarke's stories. The central one was a very short story called The Sentinel where there was some object, I think it was orbiting the moon or something, I don't remember. Uh, but it was a tetrahedron, which is the simplest three-dimensional shape. So Stanley decided that the uh, artifact should be a tetrahedron. And I looked at the web yesterday for stories about 2001. And uh, as you know, the tetrahedrons disappeared and they were replaced by this big, rec big black rectangle. Uh, they appear in the uh, light show sequence for a brief moment, I guess for sentimental reasons. And uh, so one legend said he didn't want the pyramids because that would remind people of Egypt and some kind of mysticism like that. And another person said uh, they couldn't use the pyramids because it was hard to photograph them and they didn't reflect right. But what Stanley told me was even funnier. Uh, when the tetra, in, in a preview, there was this tetrahedron, and somebody said, what's that? And Stanley said, it's a tetrahedron. And they said, I made of four triangles. They said, but what shape is it? <laughs> <laughs> Very strange thing. In fact, 
uh, a tetrahedron is it's hard to tell its shape because if you think about it, does everybody know it? An Egyptian pyramid has four triangles on a square base. A tetrahedron has three triangles on a triangular base. And, it, and I understand why the audience couldn't tell what shape it is. Because when you look at a rectangle, from almost everywhere you can see three sides. If a rectangle is in the distance, it's almost impossible for it, it has to be perfectly aligned for you to see only one face. With a tetrahedron, from almost every position, all you see is a triangle. You see, because the other sides are at such a more than 60 degree angle. So you can't see its shape. Well, there's a million stories like that. Uh, he developed all sorts of techniques to make this film. But he wouldn't tell me the plot, so I'm not responsible for <laughs> for how smart uh, Hal is. Uh, my impression from things that Arthur Clark said, said the Arthur Clark lived in our house for a while here in Brookline. And, uh, we talked about all sorts of things, mainly space stations and elevators and things like that. Um, oh, there was another scene uh, when I visited them. Uh, he had this room full of mod little black modules, which were rectangles. I'm sorry, little colorful modules, which were in slots, just like you see in some computers. And Stanley said, is that what a computer will look like in 2001? And I said, that's very beautiful. And he said, that's not what I asked. <laughs> and I said, no, they'll probably be just little black boxes, because the computer can tell what they are from inside. And he scrapped the whole set and replaced it by that very, uh, very rectangular thing. It's strange that he just wanted everything to be right and he didn't care how much it cost. And I gather that he was always raising more money for the film. Uh, one more story before I get uh, booted off this stage. Uh, many years later, uh, he called up. Uh, Stanley was a pilot in World War II, but he developed a mortal fear of flying and uh, had to take boats and things. So uh, he never flew in those days, and he used the telephone mostly. And he called up to talk about the AI movie. And, I complained that I didn't like the Philip Dick story because it had nothing to do with the artificial intelligence. It's just another story about an orphan or somebody uh, uh, doesn't, whose parents don't understand him or whatever. And uh, I thought it was a terrible movie intellectually, although the scene of New York being underwater was very exciting. <laughs> tried to talk him into doing something else like a Robert Heinlein story called The Moon is a Harsh Mistress, which was, uh, but uh, I guess he was too busy with other things. Uh, and then I asked him what he was up to, and he said, well, I don't know, I'm just mostly worried about nuclear proliferation. And this was when all these arms treaties were being reduced, and uh, the U.S. promised to Reduce, reduce us from having 60,000 nuclear weapons to just 15,000. And Stanley said, there's no point to any of that. It's not progress at all. The real danger is that some fanatic or madman will get hold of a couple of them and, uh, uh, and do something terrible. And why can't those people, uh, those politicians, understand that that's the problem? So after a long time, I said, well, you know, you made that Dr. Strangelove thing, which explained the problem more clearly than anyone else ever did. And if that didn't work, I don't know what would. Then there was an even longer silence, and Stanley said, oh, I forgot about that. <laughs> Uh, 
anyway, uh, the one other thing I had to do with the film really was designing the hands on the space pod. And uh, if you, well, I could give you a URL to see the story of that, but it's too much trouble. Uh, anybody have any questions? Because normally when I talk about artificial intelligence, I talk for about an hour about common sense and why the logical approach hasn't worked. Basically, if you take some simple story like uh, Mary gave, J Jack gave Mary the book, and I've written a whole book about this, which you can find on my webpage, and it's supposed to get published uh, this summer, called The Emotion Machine. Uh, well, uh, if, I forget who I said, <laughs> If uh, uh, Jack gave Mary the book, what does that mean? It doesn't just mean that there's a physical book in Jack's hand and then it goes through space and it goes into Mary's hand. It also means that, uh, that Jack has done her a favor. We don't know whether the book is loaned, but in any case, Mary now has control of it and Jack doesn't. And also, Mary knows that she will have intellectual access to the knowledge in the book and that sort of thing. Every simple sentence has dozens of meanings. And uh, what happened in the field of artificial intelligence is that because pe the people working there were programmers, they tried to make everything very precise and unambiguous. And that just doesn't work. Because the ambiguities in our thinking, thoughts themselves are ambiguous. And when you think of a sentence, then you understand it in a different way and bounce it back and forth and that sort of thing. So that's what we're trying to do now, to uh, get the richness of ordinary common sense thinking. The fact that Jim Slagle could do calculus, in uh, integral calculus in 1961, uh, as well as most mathematicians can, comes because you only have to know 20 or 30 things to do that. I don't know why it takes kids half a year to learn that art. If you, <laughs> if you wrote the procedures, well, it's because they're not good at high school algebra, actually. <laughs> the calculus is just about 20 statements. However, to understand the story about uh, shaking the piggy bank and deciding it has no coins in it, every child has what I estimate to be 20 or 50 million fragments of knowledge all connected in clever ways, sideways, and not in a hierarchy. And uh, we're trying to work out how to get the machine to find its way through such networks. There's never any logical implication. Logic is something you use after you've figured it out <laughs> to explain to somebody. But analogy is what you use. When you see a problem, uh, there are a million, several million problems you've solved in the past, and you have some procedure which very often finds another problem which is similar enough that you can use the way you solved it to solve the new one. So that's basically what we're working on. Um, as for 2001, uh, Arthur Clarke sort of admitted that his vision of the movie was that it was to show that people were too primitive to be allowed into space sort of a combination of pessimism and optimism because that scene at the end, how many of you have not seen 2001? About five. <laughs> <laughs> I envy you. you. I'll spoil the plot for you, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> I had the immense privilege of watching the, the opening here in Boston with Carl Sagan and Isaac Asimov, two of the most exciting people I've ever met, and I miss them both all the time. Why is there no public scientist like Carl Sagan in this whole country? Something wrong with the culture. Actually, there wasn't one before Carl Sagan either. <laughs> Lowell Thomas was a uh, geographer and a radio commentator who knew a lot of science when I was a little kid. 
And Walter Cronkite didn't know much, but he knew how to present it anyway. And now there's no one. What's the good of school if when you turn on everything else, all you learn about is sports and pop songs and that sort of thing? And there's no public scientist anywhere. We're trying to change that this city. <laughs> <laughs> Let's change it. Uh, somehow there ought to be a dozen Sagans all competing for that gold medal. Of them. I don't see anyone competing for it. The only person who publicizes science is Art Bell in the middle of the night. <laughs> <laughs> and everything he says is false. <laughs> Occasional exceptions. OK, any questions? Um, or is there any time for any questions? We, we better get started, actually, because the movie's pretty long. The movie will answer all your questions. <laughs>